All right, so we're going to start talking now about the structure of DNA. We've talked about how genes are codes or a locus or location on a chromosome, and they code for things like brown eyes or black fur. But now we're going to talk about how does that actually work? How does a code actually end up with a mouse having black fur? So before we get into um, the structure of DNA, I want to go over a couple of experiments that were done to help to discover that structure. On the AP exam, you would not be asked for these people's names, but I have seen several times where they would reference one of these experiments and expect you to know um, the basics of what happened. So Frederick Griffith's uh, experiment, he studied bacteria that caused pneumonia. And there were two basic kinds of bacteria. One had a rough coating on it, and it was non-pathogenic, meaning that particular bacteria did not cause pneumonia. And the second one had a smooth coat. What I believe it technically had was a, was a special outer coating over the rough ones. So the rough ones had this, this uh, cell wall, and the smooth ones had this coat over the cell wall, and they caused pneumonia. They were pathogenic. And I believe the reason why they would cause pneumonia is because the immune system of the mice, that's, which is uh, what he was injecting these bacteria into, could basically easily penetrate and break down the rough coat but the smooth coat sort of protected the immune system from uh, attacking it, and so those bacteria would then survive and then cause pneumonia. So he did experiments where he injected these different bacteria into mice. So the first experiment he did, he injected the rough-coated bacteria, or the R bacteria, into mice, and the mice lived, which makes sense because those bacteria are non-pathogenic, so they would not make the mice sick. He then injected the smooth-coated bacteria, sometimes they called them the S bacteria, into the mice, and the mice got pneumonia and they died. Again, that makes sense. So then he boiled the smooth bacteria, and when he boiled them, it killed them. And so he basically injected dead bacteria into the mice, and the mice did not get sick. Again, this makes sense because he basically was showing that the, that the bacteria has to be alive to cause illness. The last experiment is the important one, though. He took some of those bacteria that had been boiled and he mixed them with living bacteria that were the non-pathogenic kind and injected that into the mice and the mice died. So this was an unexpected result because the rough coat bacteria shouldn't cause illness and the smooth ones were dead. And we already showed in the previous experiment that when the smooth ones are dead, they don't cause illness. So he basically discovered that what was happening um, was something called transformation. So this is just a visual of what he did. Again, uh, Smooth bacteria kill the mice. Rough bacteria, the mice are unaffected. If you boil the smooth bacteria, no problem, the mice are unaffected. But if you mix the dead boiled ones with living rough bacteria, this killed the mice. So this is called transformation. And what happens in transformation is that the harmless bacteria that were alive actually picked up a factor from the dead bacteria. And that factor transformed them or changed them. So he did not know what the factor was, but today we know that factor was DNA. So in essence, this would be sort of like if you could swallow some DNA and your eye color changed. I mean, in essence, that's basically what happened, is that these DNA fragments were codes for making the smooth coating. And when the living bacteria absorbed that, it now had the DNA to make a smooth coat, and it changed to where it now could make a smooth coat. Again, he didn't know it was the DNA that was causing this. He just knew it was some kind of a factor. So that brings us to a second experiment, Avery. So now what he did, and this is important, he's the one that actually showed it was the DNA and not some other thing in the bacteria. What he did was he took um, enzymes. Notice how these all end in ACE. So the first thing he did was he tried using an enzyme that breaks down DNA, and he broke down all the DNA in the S bacteria. Then he injected, he mixed that with the living rough bacteria, injected into a mouse, and the mice lives. So he showed that if you got rid of the DNA, that the bacteria did not get transformed. He repeated the experiment with enzymes to break down all the other things in the S bacteria. So break down the RNA break down the lipids, break down the proteins. Even if he used enzymes and broke down all the other things from the S bacteria, as long as the DNA from the S bacteria was still intact, 
it was able to transform the R bacteria into a tra um, an S bacteria. So he basically showed that the factor that was important in the transformation was actually the DNA and not proteins, lipids, or anything else. All right, this is another experiment they ask about a lot on the AP exam. So Hershey and Chase used radioactive isotopes. So a reminder from the biochemistry chapter, a radioactive isotope is like a tag um, that glows. And so um, these bacteriophages, a bacteriophage, or sometimes they're just called phages, is a virus that infects bacteria. They look something like this. So this is a bacteriophage, and then it would um, attack a bacterium and make it sick, kill it, whatever it would do to it. Um, so the virus has only two parts. The outer coating is made of protein. And then the inner part of a virus, because viruses are very simple, on these bacteriophages was DNA. So he wanted to know, since he knew that these viruses infected bacteria, what part of the virus was actually the important part in transmission. So he used radioactive isotopes, like I said. So P32, the P stands for phosphorus because DNA has, if you recall from one of our previous chapters, a lot of phosphates. So that means that if he, if he uses uh, radioactive phosphorus, DNA would glow. He then used a second radioactive isotope, S35. S in this case is sulfur because proteins have sulfur. It's one of their R groups. Now it's important that he picked these specific isotopes because for example, DNA also has nitrogen and it also has carbon. But the thing is, protein has nitrogen and carbon too. So by picking specifically phosphorus, they knew that isotope would only tag the DNA and that S35 sulfur would only tag the protein. And that way they would be able to distinguish and figure out when the virus infected the bacteria, which part was the actual part that ended up inside the bacteria causing the infection. And the conclusion of this is that it was the DNA. So he basically showed that uh, we already saw that DNA was the transforming factor in bacteria that could turn a bacteria that was non-pathogenic into one that was. And now in this experiment, they also showed that DNA was the thing that actually caused infection when a virus infected a bacteria. And so here's just a little picture of what they did. So in the first experiment, they tagged the protein. So the protein in the virus would glow. Let that virus infect a cell, and at the end of the experiment, no glowing. So they showed that the protein coat of the virus did not end up inside the bacteria. Now repeat it with DNA. That got radioactively tagged green, let it infect the bacteria, and at the end of the experiment, they were able to see that the inside of the bacteria glowed, showing it was the DNA that actually got transferred to the bacteria. All right, um, this guy, Shargaff, he came up with something called, I believe it's called like Shargaff's Law. Um, but here's the deal. Again, at this point, they kind of knew that DNA was important. They knew that it carried information. They knew that it was transferred in bacteria and viruses but they didn't know what it looked like. They still didn't know the structure of DNA. So one of the things that they knew was that DNA was made of these nitrogen bases. And you probably remember learning these before. A, T, G, and C. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Um, but they didn't know really what was important about them exactly or how they were arranged in DNA. So at this point, Shargaff basically, he found that in, he studied a bunch of different species and in every species he, he studied, he found that the amounts of A and T were always very similar to each other, and that G and C were always very similar to each other. So here's Shargaff's rules. I think that's actually what it's called. Notice here, Streptococcus, which is a bacteria. The amount of A and T, very similar to each other. Different from G and C, but G and C are also very similar to each other. He did it in yeast, which is a fungus. Same thing, A and T very similar, G and C, a herring, which is a fish, A and T similar, G and C similar, and then in a human, A and T similar, G and C similar. Now, today we know why A and T would be similar, because we now know that A connects to T and G connects to C. You probably remember learning that in ninth grade. So his rules, he, he kind of laid the basis for the discovery of how the bases connect to each other in DNA. All right. Um, so the basic structure of DNA, 
It's made of nucleotides, and a nucleotide, and this we studied before, back in biochemistry chapter, um, is a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose. This is where the deoxyribo nucleic acid comes from. A phosphate group, which you remember is a phosphorus with four oxygens. And then a nitrogen base. And the nitrogen bases, there's four of them in DNA. That's A, T, G, and C. So the bases, let's talk a little bit about these nitrogen bases. Uh, first, here's a nucleotide. So to recognize the sugar in a nucleotide, look for the pentagon. Technically, the, it's not, the five carbons are not all in the pentagon. Um, and we're going to talk more about this on Monday. Four of the carbons here, 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 and here are in the pentagon. And the fifth one is sticking off the end of, of it. But it's still the easiest way to identify. Since it's a five carbon or a pento sugar, the thing shaped like a pentagon is always going to be your sugar. Phosphate, PO4. Sometimes they'll just draw a circle with a P to represent phosphate. They won't actually write out these four oxygens. And then this is a nitrogen base. When we get further into the chapter, they're going to stop drawing out these bases. But it's called a nitrogen base because uh, all these places where there's no letter, those are carbons, and all these ends are nitrogens. So the, that's those are the nitrogen bases. Um, again, there are four of them, and eventually you're going to get to a point where they're probably going to simplify and they're going to do something like this, and they're going to just like write A or T or G or C, and they're not going to draw it out. But this is what they actually look like. They're these rings of carbon and nitrogen, so they're called nitrogen bases. All right. So a little bit about these four bases. Um, two of them have single rings, and that's cytosine and thymine. Notice how they only have one ring. And adenine and guanine have two rings here. Um, the ones with one ring are called pyrimidines, and you should memorize that C and T are the pyrimidines, and A and G are the purines, double rings. Here, see how there's two rings on each of them. You would not have to tell the difference from a picture like this between A and G or between C and T. You can actually identify them in a DNA, and we'll go over that, but just from a random picture, you should be able to identify whether it's a purine or pyrimidine. Last year, I don't remember who, but somebody in my AP class came up with a kind of a cutesy way to remember the purines. Um, if you can think of this, think angels, are pure. They're so pure that they have basically two rings instead of one. Double the rings because they're so pure. So A and G are your purines and purines have two rings. So it might be helpful, it may not, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. I thought it was kind of cute that they came up with that. So angels are pure. A and G are the purines and purines have two rings because they're so pure they've got double. Um, so those are your purines and pyrimidines. Uh, double helix. We know today that DNA is a double helix. The way it was discovered is a technique called x-ray diffraction. You basically bounce x-rays off of something and it'll give a pattern. And the pattern that came back when Wilkins and Franklin did x-ray diffraction was that DNA had a helix shape. And then two other guys, Watson and Crick, they basically built a 3D model of DNA using the information from Wilkins and Franklin. It was kind of this whole race, there's a movie about it called A Race for the Double Helix, and there's some controversy about who stole whose work and some stuff, but the bottom line is, after all of the work was done, the x-ray diffraction determined that it was a helix, and then Watson and Crick were able to build and show it was a double helix. Um, Watson and Crick, we, they basically knew that the double helix, it, it was the same width all the way down. So if you put, if, if it was purines and purines, and then pyrimidines and pyrimidines, this would not be the same width all the way down. Some pieces of DNA would be wider than others. And that's how they figured out that it had to always be one double ring connecting to one single ring. So that's what they basically discovered when they finally put it together. Um, and down here at the bottom, you can actually see, and this is where you would be able to identify A, T, G, and C. Because if you remember the angels are pure, that means that A and G are your double rings, so angels are pure. Um, a connects to T, and A always connects to T with two hydrogen bonds, and G connects to C with three hydrogen bonds. So if you were to look at this, see how there's three hydrogen bonds, I know it's a G to C, and since I know angels are pure, this has to be the G, because it's the double ring, and this would be the C. And the same here. 
A to T with two bonds. This has to be the A because it's the double.